Discovering technology afresh. I think this is our first mirror school that we've ever done live on Facebook. Unfortunately, we didn't press the right button for the second session, but the second session is recorded in very, very tangible, real living epistles. Can you imagine? I do. I mean, I can just imagine Paul going cartwheel mode right now and saying, you know, look at the technology, guys. And Paul's voice has never dwindled. I so enjoy um, Philippians chapter 2. 12 where Paul says not only in my presence but much more in my absence absence. imagine Paul anticipating the moment final epistle would arrive at some church door you know that was it Paul wasn't going to write another epistle please Paul do us a favor add another epistle or two that's it they will still expect waiting for him to arrive in Rome never land up in Rome but he says, much more in my absence. You know that the success of New Testament ministry is how absent you can preach yourself. <laughs> Paul is more present today in his message than it could ever be in his person. We're living in such a moment, such a moment of time where not just, I oh, thank God for technology and what technology adds to the opportunity, the uniqueness of the opportunity. <laughs> To have something to say and have a ready audience. Mankind will always be the immediate audience of God. In these last days, Hebrews chapter 1, God spoke to us in sonship. You see, sin is not doing stuff wrong. Sin is missing out on sonship. My son, you've always been with me. All that I have is yours. And so Holy Spirit just invites us to embrace what we are embraced in. In the bosom of the Father. And Jesus in, in John 14 speaks about going somewhere. You know, he's not going to become a mansion builder as the King James suggests. He's going to the cross to die humanity's death. Mm-hmm. So that a wide open door will be our future of the bosom of the Father. Where we may engage for all eternity in the bosom of the Father, in, the, in oneness with Him. Union is not something that we, some of us might get, you know, if we hop through the right hoops. Union is what the New Testament is all about. We we looked at John uh, 14, John 14, verse 20 yesterday. And just for the sake of um, helping us seeing the the relevance of that, you know, that Jesus says, in that day you will know that I am in the Father. So if we have these circles just helping us visualize Jesus present in the Father. He says, in that day you will know that I'm in my Father. Our knowledge does not put Jesus in the Father. Sometimes we, dis- we, we, we think that when we discover, you know, in grade one, when the teacher finally gets through to us, that listen, one apple plus another apple equals two apples. And when one plus one finally makes sense to us and it a- actually equals two, you know, it's been true before we got it. See, truth doesn't become true by popular vote. You know, while, while for generations, you know, we earthlings believed that this earth was a flat surface. And it didn't suddenly, you know, just kind of curve into a ball when, when some of us began to believe that it's actually round. So here Jesus announces that in that day you will, you will know, you will know that I'm in my Father. And here's the beauty of this unveiling. He says that you are in me, this mankind. And he says that I am in you. This Holy Spirit. We are wrapped up into this understanding. 1 John 5.20. I might as well read 1 John 5.20 to you. Just, just to get us going. I know it's lunch. We've just had lunch and it's Saturday afternoon. I don't know what rugby is on on the TV right now. But, but here we are. You know, we're not watching rugby. We're just engaging with a conversation that 
exceeds time. 1 John, let me read you 1 John 5, 21. I know the, the RSV off by heart because I mean, the RSV was my Bible for many, many years and I love the RSV. But um, uh, the RSV says in that, says, um, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding to know Him who is true. And then comes the punchline. And we are in Him who is true. Whoa. I remember I preached once um, in, in, was it in Italy? And we did, we had two sessions. We had a morning session and an evening session. And you know the Italians, they go loud. They say, we walk in, I arrive there just uh, about 10 minutes, 15 minutes before the evening session. And we've got the young people and they've got their pastor who was the interpreter who interpreted for me. They've got him pinned on 1 John 5.20. And he's, he's, you know, he says, come and help me, Francis. He says, these guys are they're attacking me. They say, why didn't you ever preach that verse to us? <laughs> 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 I said, well, I the yeah. <laughs> Do you have the understanding? You see, we thought if we can just repeat the historic reference of 2017 years today ago, Jesus arrived on planet Earth. But the Son of God has come to give us understanding to know Him who is true. And what is the punchline of knowing him who is true is to know that we are in him yeah. who is true the Greek says he's given us a mind to know so in the mirror of the Bible I'll just read it to you quickly um, let me read you oh yeah Ooh, a can of... verse 19 we know that we have our origin in God yet the whole world lies trapped in blindfold mode in the blindfold mode of a lost identity intoxicated by the Poneros system of a futile mentality of hardships, labors, and annoyances. The Greek word Poneros may have translated evil. The world lies in this evil, but evil, the word Poneros suggests a, a, a life of hardships, annoyances, and labors. You know, if you go to the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the, of the Old Testament, you, you read about the two trees in the garden, and the one tree is called the tree of hardships, labors, and annoyances, you know, the Poneros tree. So often, especially in one John, I do a little reference on the Poneros system. Um, so let me just, just, just hop over and get, get on with it. Verse 20. This is what has become distinctly clear to us. The coming of the Son of God is God's mission accomplished. Um, God's mission accomplished. He is the incarnate Christ. The moment all of Scripture pointed to has arrived. Stop reading Daniel in future tense mode or the book of Revelation in future tense mode. Does he drink any honey? He is toch honey, brother. Yeah, but he is not for us to waste our honey. He is going to say, go your own. Look, he is now right. Maybe we have to give him a little bit of a Then he will go. Is it okay? Can you see what I can't do, Okay, so let's just read 1, 1 John 5, 20 again. This is what has become distinctly clear to us. Do you know that Jesus did not come to confuse us about God? Let me come and say, okay, right, guys, you know, you, let, let me just, just, I, I'm just, I know you, you're not going to, he came to unveil the Father. The coming of the Son of God is God's mission accomplished. He is the incarnate Christ. The moment all of Scripture pointed to has arrived. The Son is present. In Him God has given us the greatest gift, a mind, whereby we may know Him who is true. And in the same knowing, to find ourselves there in Him who is true. Mankind is fully included and located in Him, in His Son Jesus Christ. This means that whatever Jesus is as Son, we are. This is the true God. This is the life of the ages. And then verse 21 says, This defeats every image of our imagination that could possibly compete with the authentic likeness of our design. Darling children, distance yourselves from every substitute image, which is what idolatry is all about. The word idolatry, and it just stems from the same word, the word image. Because the theme of scripture is just the image and the likeness of God. Unveiled in human form and redeemed in human form. You know, Jesus did not arrive on planet Earth in a Superman suit. His passport to this planet was his mother's womb. 
His body was exactly like ours. He didn't have some access to some superhuman body. He came to redeem the fact that God did not make a mistake when He made the biological part of you. He came to redeem the fact that you are the very intention of God. You see, we've, we've, we've gone so far in, in, in you know, um, uh, what's the word? Dividing ourselves into spirit, soul, and body. That we've got these three entities, you know, there's like, there's a seamlessness about you that does not conflict in spirit language, in soul language, in body language. God's head over heels in love with you. Mm. You might think that the body part is like, God says that you're my address. You're my address. Body, soul, and spirit. And in Him, the fullness of the God, it dwells bodily. So we are just engaging in our conversation about the, we looked this morning at the, the, the kavar and twine mode that we are absolutely by design compatible to engage in. You don't need to have some kind of download before you can now also, you know the thing about, I mean we've got iPhones, I don't sell the idea of an iPhone, but I mean, you know the problem with iPhones, you've got this fantastic device but you've got to buy the apps. And sometimes we've got our Christianity also more and more is there, you know. You're okay, you start with Jesus, you know, especially if you, if you respond to my altar call, then we're going to get you going. And, but oh, now, you know, for the rest of your life, you're going to have to buy apps. And then we've got all these apps on the market, you know, and this one can do that, and that one can do that. And, and we've bought into so many recipes, you know, and, and apps, and we've really actually so complicated our lives with all the baggage that we had to now buy into so that we can become now more sanctified. I'm so in love with just the simplicity of Paul's gospel. He says in 1 Corinthians, he says that... Um, I might as well read that as well. In, uh, oh, thank you, Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'll just read you verse 30 quickly here. That's a beautiful chapter. I mean, once you just really spend time just pondering 1 Corinthians 1. But here he says in verse 30, um, uh, Of God's doing are we in Christ. You see, we're looking at the, this John 14 verse 20 is not the end goal. This is where it all begins. But in that day, he says, you will know that as I'm in my Father, so you are in me. So the same basis that Jesus and the Father are one. Remember they wanted to stone him when he said, I and the Father, we are one. They said, how dare you, man, make yourself equal with God. And Jesus says, oh, I'm sorry, man. Jesus went and he quoted Asaph, the prophet, from Psalm 84. He says, I say you are gods. And they know the rest of the psalm. The next line says, all of your sons are the most high. So Jesus doesn't apologize for the fact that as He's in the Father, so we are in Him and He is in us. And we'll, we'll, we'll explore a bit of that, um, hopefully this afternoon, so we see how far we go. But here we've got it in verse 30 of chapter 1 Corinthians. Of God's doing are we in Christ. The question might be, but how do we land up there? How do we get there? And, and if you read some Christian material, they will tell you all kinds of recipes on how to get in Christ. You know, and how to get Christ in you. It's like, it's like, you know, if you're into geology and you have to now go to the farmer and it's been a maize farm for generations. But you're a geologist and he's related to you and you want to make him feel better about his field. So what you do is you buy some gold. You buy a bag of gold somewhere. And you go and dig a hole and you hide the gold in his soil. And you go and tell him, listen, yeah. You must just, just uncover there's a treasure in your field. But the geologist put it there. You know what I mean? We, we, we've kind of gone into that kind of theology. Mm -hmm. You know, some people have, for some people this is true. But for most people, okay, man, maybe Jesus is in the Father, but the rest of humanity <laughs> was flat places around in the universe. You know, you're hopping around, you know, bouncing off the walls, and you never quite know where you are. You are as in Christ as Jesus is in the Father. And Christ is in you as much as the Holy Spirit is in Jesus. That's a good starting point. I mean, <laughs> Romans chapter 1. Well, let me just finish one Corinthians. Otherwise, we're going to get confused. Yeah, listen to this. Of God's doing, are we in Christ? You know what? To begin with. This is not some reward that heaven's handing out to the, the, the most saintly of us. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, they asked Mother Teresa, they said, what, what motivates you to go out in the streets of Calcutta in these odd hours? What, what, what gets you going? She says, um, I go to minister to my Lord. 
in his most disturbing disguises. She understood something about ministering to him. So what, what, when were you in prison? When were you that sick that you landed up in hospital? He says, you've done it to the least, you've done it unto me. You've done it to the most unlikely. You've done it unto me. So Paul says this, let me read him again. Of God's doing are we in Christ. Do you get that? The Greek word is ek. The word ek is a preposition that always points to the source. So out of God's doing. This is not the result of our striving, of our trying to get better people, that we finally land up here. Of God's doing are you in Christ to begin with. Remember we said in the earlier session, we've wasted so much time trying to get there. When there is where you are to begin with. You see, that's the difference between window shopping and mirror gazing. Window shopping will keep the ugly duckling mindset going for as much mileage as you can get out of that silly thing. And will sell to you the idea that you need this facelift and that one, and then eventually I might just upgrade you to swim like this. That's not what it's all about. It's all about discovering the truth of your original, authentic design, mirrored in Christ. Not to tease you with the potential you, but the truth about you. To take sides with him and say, Father, I agree with you. What you voice concerning me in Jesus, because Jesus is what God believed. They wanted me to add a, a complete statement of faith here. I said, listen, I've got a very simple statement of faith. It says, Jesus is what God believes. And there's only one faith that matters. It's what Jesus reveals concerning God's belief. Okay, so let me just try and read through verse 30. Oh, of God's doing are we in Christ. He is both the genesis and genius of our wisdom. God has made him to be wisdom. Remember we looked in James chapter 1 verse 5, the only thing that you could possibly lack. No, it's not finances, it's not opportunities, it's wisdom. Hmm. And where do you get it? From the source. How do you get it? Through Kabbalah mode, entwining. Entwining. Discovering that he wants to download and reboot my being in his wisdom. James speaks about the two kinds of wisdom. Remember the wisdom that comes from above? Hmm. Or the earthly devilish wisdom that is all connected to the diabolical system, the fallen mindset, the distortion. Is both the genesis and genius of our wisdom. A wisdom that reveals how righteous, sanctified, and redeemed we already are in Him. Let's read the commentary note. I said, Your mankind's association in Christ is God's doing. In God's economy, Christ represents us. What mankind could never achieve through personal discipline and willpower as taught in every religion, God's faith accomplished in Christ. Of His design are we in Christ. We are associated in one in union with Him. Our wisdom is sourced in this union. Also our righteousness, holiness originate from... Okay, speak about this harmony. Is our claim to fame. So there we are. We find ourselves located... In him by his design by his doing so when Paul writes let me just run you through to Colossians chapter chapter 1 okay um, I know I, 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 I hardly miss an opportunity to 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 say what I'm just going to say now. I, I preach Matthew 13, 44 as if I wrote it and not Matthew. I really, to me, it's one of the most pivotable, pivotable, pivotable. I grew up in Cape Town, you know, we, 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 we went through a time where we, 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 we didn't preach for many, many years. And I know a man ate now a man camp. I went Bombay in the Transvaal. And I have these like 200 men to speak to, and I haven't spoken in public for many years. And I have to go to the young and I have to go to the free in Afrikaans. Anyway, I shouldn't even go there, but anyway. I mean, a guy phoned me uh, weeks later, he says he ordered the set of tapes, but they had to edit. And I was a few words that I had to go to the Transvaal in Transvaal. Hij zei nog nooit iemand die woord wordt zeer onder een sal van mij. Ik heb niet rustig dat die woord van de broek is verkeerd zijn. Ja, Jesus Colossians is beautiful. Within us. Oké. 
I'll get to Colossians, but let me just give you a little introduction to Colossians, Matthew 13, 44. So Jesus has these um, Jewish guys there, they're businessmen, they're farmers, and he makes this statement, one of the most powerful statements in one sentence. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in an agricultural field. The Afrikaans translation has it correct. It says asylum. All the other translations just say a field, but the Greek word agri suggests that it's a cultivated field. It's a field with a cultivated value, an established value. Now you can ask any farmer, you know, that when you go into the, into the agricultural um, uh, context and you want to buy a specific field, your immediate connection with that field is what kind of produce, what kind of return, what, what, how many cattle can you carry, how, how many vats of wine can we in a good year harvest from this, from this acre of land. So, so agricultural land has a very specific, very uh, historic value attached to it. That's what you buy. So here Jesus has the attention of his entire audience. I mean, you can imagine a Joodse boer and a Joodse besigheidsman. Die manne leister met spits oore. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in an agricultural field. And they, he's got that full attention. And he says to them, and a man finds the treasure. I mean, that's a beautiful story. You can imagine for generations the field just lies there as a known agricultural piece of property. But all along, there is a treasure hidden in the field. You see, I want you to understand something about what statement Jesus made here in John 14, verse 20. He says, not only will you know that I'm in my Father, but you'll make the greatest discovery that you could ever make in your life. You're in me. And I'm in you. It's the greatest unveiling. It is the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations. But because it was hidden, it doesn't make it absent. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in an agricultural field. Mm -hmm. And a man finds the treasure. Already the Jews go into their minds and go, oh, there's so much more to this field than what we've known. There's so much more to me than what I've realized. A man finds the treasure. And what this man does startles them. He hides it again. And he goes away. And those Jews think, you're the one at the plan. I mean, this man has a plan. He is the only person on the planet who knows about the, planet, the treasure. Everybody else have, have, have a judgment about this field and it's agriculturally related, you know, it's, it's, it's an historic value. And maybe it might even be a very neglected piece of land. You might be overgrown by now by thorns and thistles. If this land represents the world, then surely it's been a neglected land. It's overgrown with thorns and thistles. It's perhaps not worth that much in the current market. So this man hides the treasure and he goes away to do what? To do a transaction. To buy the entire field. But obviously, he has a unique opportunity to buy this field for peanuts. He can go pick it up as the largest bargain you can imagine because nobody else knows about his true value. Their minds have been educated to know this field. Ah, I was looking long down again. It's the apple in the eye. And he shocks them. He says, this man goes away. And he sells all he has and he buys the entire field. Who would do that? I want you to understand the context here. Jesus is not about to tell them a parable that creates the idea that he's going to go and bargain with the devil. Mm. To redeem. Jesus did not buy you from the devil. A thief never becomes an owner. And if the earth, Psalm 24 verse 1, if the earth is indeed the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. Jesus didn't have to go to the Father and say, Father, how much blood do you want? He said, I'll, I'll, you can just tap it empty. You know, I'll just, I'll. Jesus goes and he pays the highest price to redeem our minds from the lies that we believed about ourselves. What was the unbelief of Israel all about? 
they believed a lie about themselves. What an insult to an image bearer of God to liken themselves to grasshoppers. We'll just be humble, you know. I'll just be a little, I'll just be a little squirrely worm. You know? I'll just be a little grasshopper. I don't want to. Listen, what an insult. You are God's selfie to begin with. You know, we don't understand why people go and pay ridiculous prices for, for a Van Gogh painting until we discover Van Gogh. Wow. Image bearer you are. Image bearer you are. We have, says Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And the Greek word ostrikon speaks of an oyster carrying the treasure. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. But what's wrong with us? That's 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7. I might as well jump there as well because this, this stuff's so good. Remember we want to go to Colossians once in time. And where are we now? 2 Corinthians 4. Okay. I'll have to back up a bit in 2 Corinthians 4. Now you must remember 2 Corinthians 4. Paul did not write in chapters and verses. But the conversation continues from the previous chapter where Paul makes one of the most amazing statements that's recorded in this book. That's why we call it the Murder Bible. He says in verse 18 of the previous chapter, and now, with unveiled faces, we all. That's why, you know, Paul's name reminds of Paul always speaks about we all. <laughs> all. We all. With unveiled faces. Gazing. No longer window shopping. Gazing at the murder. And the metamorphe takes place, which is the opposite of the word hamarte, which means sin, distortion. Something happens in my being, and I begin to recognize the image and the likeness of God evident in me. So Paul says in the next chapter, he says, um, if our message seems, I'll, I'll read you from verse 2. I mean, it's just such a beautiful chapter. This in verse 2 says, we have renounced hidden agendas. I'm reading from the Mirror Bible. In, in, in brackets, I said, they're employing a little bit of the law in an attempt to balance out grace. He says, we've renounced hidden agenda. So hidden agenda is to bring in a little leaven, a little bit of, uh, let's, let's, let's just give God a hand, you know. I mean, we've got a meeting halfway now. <laughs> and it's amazing how we will be better to, to, to re receive 100% download from God in every other department except our money. And we there, we've got to just, just contribute at least our 10%. And we might just better get the spell and get God to persuade to open the windows of heaven. As if heaven owes us anything. We have distanced ourselves from any obscure craftiness to manipulate God's word to make it mean what it does not say. With truth on open display in us, we highly recommend our lives to everyone's conscience. By the word conscience, the way the word conscience, sun edo, is the opposite of the word hades. Haides, haides, not to see. Sunides means to see together. That sounds like metanos. Here's a metanos moment, a metanoia moment. Lydia and I, we had the privilege to, to run a safari business for many years, in the, not for many years, but for, for wonderful time, times. Yeah, some years in the Sabi San Game Reserve, we would take out walking safaris and, 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 and we'd receive guests for three, for three nights. They'd come to our lunch and we, we, would, we would show them, you know, what the brochures couldn't even show them. We will tease them with the brochures, but they'll come and see the real deal there. And, and our job as guides our job was not to try and fake the lion's roar or get the latest you know dvd of national geographic and entertain them with what they can see in america but just to bring them into an environment where the real thing happens you know and to host that opportunity and um, to see together with thank you lydia <laughs> and when, we, when we're in this group, we usually have 10 guests, and we'll go on our walking safari, and you don't, you know, walk, you know, like you go to the zoo, and in the next case, and you're right, ladies and gentlemen, we've got very what an ox is among many years, it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's a lot more intimate and engaging like this, you know, you, 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 you connect with, with all the markings, you know, in the, in the felt, and they, they spoor, and the smells, and the sounds, and and, and, and you don't have to say much. We're just hosting an opportunity where the seeing eye and the hearing ear kicks in for itself. Mm. Where, you, where you just host an opportunity where they go, ah, oh, 
But you know the beauty is, you know, whether you're in a vehicle or on foot, although on foot is a lot more engaging and intimate, but you, you don't have to tell the people, okay now, did you see that leopard over there? You just watch their faces and their faces go, oh, and the very next thing is they, they get their neighbor, because the neighbor might be just a little bit looking in the wrong direction, say, over there. Now, if, if we are wired to see others included in the moment, the idea was not to go on some safari, and then we all shut up about what we see. We're just going to say, mm, I saw something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you get home around the campfire and say, I saw a leopard. You know what I mean? Sometimes you think that's, no, no, no. It's like, we're in this together. There's a joint singing. Sunedo. So Paul, Paul encourages us, he says here, uh, verse 2, that with, the, with, with truth in open display, and as we highly recommend our lives, to everyone's conscience, conscience is the Latin for sunedo, to see together, conscience, to see together. Truth finds its most authentic and articulate expression in human life, beats any doctrinal debate. Verse 3, if our message seems vague to anyone, it is not because we are without, withholding some from certain people. It's just because some are so stubborn in their efforts to uphold an outdated system that they don't see it. They are all equally found in Christ, but they prefer to remain lost in the cul-de-sac language of the law. There's a back four. Verse four. And the survival, the survival and self-improvement programs of the religious systems of this world veil the minds of the unbeliever. Exploiting their ignorance about their true origin and their redeemed innocence, the veil of unbelief obstructs a person's view and keeps them from seeing what the light of the gospel so clearly reveals, which is what? The glory of God is the image and likeness of our maker redeemed in human form. This is what the gospel of Jesus is all about. And then verse 5 says, we, 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 even though we recommend ourselves with great confidence, it is not with arrogance. We do not preach ourselves. We preach Christ Jesus, the Lord. We are addicted to this gospel employed by Jesus for your sakes. The light is founded in the same God who said, Light be, and light shone out of darkness. He lit the lamp in our understanding so that we may clearly recognize the features of his likeness in the face of Jesus Christ reflected within us. And now, verse 7 says, And in the glow of this glorious light and with unveiled faces, we discover the treasure where it was hidden all along in these frail skin suits made of clay we did not invent ourselves we are god's idea to begin with and the dynamic of his doing and amazing engineering the word translated earthen vessel or clay pot is the word ostrakinos from ostrakon an oyster it is a great visual picture of how we carry a very valuable pearl within us the cosmetic value of the clay potter can never compete with the treasure it holds. You see, the vessel takes its value from the treasure it holds. So if the kingdom of heaven is all about a redeemed treasure, it's no longer a hidden mystery. What Jesus redeemed on behalf of the human race has brought into view the treasure of treasures and you know what he did he sold all he had and he bought the what the entire field do you see that equation now if any businessman is prepared to go into such a deal and sells all he has then what happens to what he what he gets it becomes all he has so Jesus just wants to bring the shift in our thinking because the earth is already the Lord's. But we don't realize it. We think we belong to this or to that or this. You know, Lydia and I had an experience the other day. We were walking. We would go for regular beautiful walks where, where we lived in the mountains in the Swartberg area. And um, we've just received a letter from our um, auditors. And, and it's, it's, it's tax related. And you know what happens when... Uh, it's like when you drive your car. You know, you're just having a lot... And, and there's a traffic officer that pops up. And suddenly you start feeling guilty. You're guilty. You see, cop, no. And he says, sit belt on. He says, I have to put immediately. And you start feeling guilty. And you've done nothing wrong. And he's, he's so we have one of those moments. That's where I'm screwed up. And I said to Lydia, as we walked, I said, you know, I so enjoy the way Jesus addresses the tax issues. And immediately what came to mind was, yes, Peter, Simon Peter. And uh, 
Jesus is about to solve a very personal tax issue. And he doesn't tell Peter to go and sweat this one out. He says, oh, yeah, okay, Peter, you can follow us and go to this. He says, now come praat jy, maar, he's too going to go for him to help us. He can scrape out the school to go. So he says, you follow us without info. He says, Peter, why don't you go and do what you enjoy doing most? Let's go fishing, bro. Just go and do what you enjoy doing most. Go and go do You see, sometimes our minds play games with us. And just before we complete that thought, we know what happened. I mean, they, he caught a fish. But there's a thing in the back of the back. He said, I'm going to tell you how belasting die. So, <laughs> You don't sweat about things that you can discover when you go into Kabamo. And you know, Kabamo doesn't take you to this like spooky spiritual stuff. I disengage the way you are, I remember the first time, and we've, we've been out of ministry for many, many years, and this guy invites me to go and talk at some situation. And I meet him, I fly him to Joburg, and I meet him in this public place. And he hasn't seen me for many, many years. I start up and I say, Well, hallelujah, praise God! <laughs> you know, <laughs> brother, and you know you can, we can talk such nonsense, no. such nonsense. <laughs> Dissolve. <laughs> You're in a public place. Shut up. <laughs> Please, there. The grove is a good. You're living in a person. Listen, if you fish like that, you will never catch a fish. <laughs> you don't have it. Ah, he's a fisherman. He's making a troll. He's in. Lovely story was a true story, I'm sure. There's this bunch of farmers from the Freistaat. You know, they're very into their fishing. They've, they've bought every fishing magazine. You know. <laughs> they've got a long weekend coming up. You know, no couple of the teas, there's Kakari Brothers. They bought their most expensive equipment. And they, they're going down for this weekend on the south coast. And they're going to find the elder slum. Sharks. Call them sharks. No, no, not sharks. Who's a rapid? Elder. Shad. They're going to they're gonna go shad. <laughs> so, here come my brother. It's great. Where's the 4 by 4s The days that I throw the most expensive gear. And that's the thing. I'm going to go and go. And I'm going and I'm going. But next, nothing happens. But not very far from then, there's a local guy, Indian brother, standing there with his old bamboo um, uh, rod. No, what, what do you call it? Yeah, for stock. Coffee grinder. Yeah. And then the old coffee grinder. And many. It just brings in shed after shed after shed. It's embarrassing. I mean, you can't stand there with the expensive equipment and all those tips from my car. But you need all the fish. He dance all the fish. So eventually, one of them thought, you know, no, no, I've got to go and just talk to this guy. You know, just humble myself and speak to him. So he said, Excuse me, sir, but I mean, what's your secret? And the man looked surprised. He said, Don't you know this is the Indian Ocean? <laughs> 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 yeah, I love you so much. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, we've tried all our skills, but it's the dimension that God invites us to. You see, cover mode is not some kind of luxury mode, it's the mode of our design. We can gauge our thoughts, <coughs> throne room realities. And suddenly, life turns into an adventure in the midst of the contradiction. So there we're going for our walk, and Holy Spirit reminds us of Peter doing something that's really easy. He knows how to fish. He doesn't have to know, okay, now, Jesus, what should I, should I cast over my left shoulder, right shoulder, should I do? No, just go and do what you do. Just go and fish. And he remembers that time, you know, when they toiled all night and they took nothing. And that was when the old karma system was still in place. I'm always so surprised when I read about Jesus' first encounter with Simon. You can imagine them illiterate because they've got to fish while the other guys, they, they've got to yeah, be awake when the other guys sleep. And then when the other guys go to school, they sleep. And so they, in case they catch the entire night, they do. Jesus didn't arrive at the scene and say, oh, you guys are doing it wrong. Come on, let me show you how to fold the net. No, 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 no. Let me introduce you to a new. No, no, their system is nothing wrong with their system. But there was something hugely wrong with their beliefs. Because they took all, they, they toiled all night and took nothing. How do you equate yourselves with 
doing my best, and I get nothing. Aha! Very simple. It's called sin management. Remember, you've paid now tonight with taking no catch because you've done something bad. So sin consciousness kicks in, and now I feel better about the fact that I toiled all night, took nothing, but now at least I've paid for it tonight. So tomorrow night, I'm going with a clean slate. Why do I say this? Because Jesus gets Simon, you know, let's use your boat to go out. And he talks, and Simon sits there, your knee is tired, he wants to go to sleep, and suddenly the word arrests him. And Jesus says, why don't we go out a little bit deeper and go and lay down the nets? He has every reason to out-argue Jesus and say, listen, we don't do that. You're the carpenter, I'm the fisherman. You can join us tonight. This is time we're going to sleep now. He says, at your word, let's do it. And what happens? The nets tear. And Jews do not tie those knots in their nets so that it can tear. I mean, they, they go for the biggest possible imaginable catch. And this time, they go for beyond the biggest and most imaginable catch. And instead of Peter going, typical Jews say, Jesus, what are you doing tonight? You know, we've got a partnership. And, um, I know we work for a, for a brother. They call him the Saint. That's funny. He's a don. He's a don of your brother. He's a real old thunder. So we work for the sons of the thunder. And he says, he says, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Check how sin consciousness kicks in. I can take no credit for this catch because I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve this. Isn't it crazy how we flush grace? Because we don't get credit for this stuff, but because it's of God's doing of you in Christ. You didn't land up here because something you did. You are here by design. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, says Paul. We don't arrive and say, oh, it's been there all along. We've judged ourselves on skin value when we carry the treasure. Because of unbelief, because our minds have gone into blindfold mode with Israel. Believing a lie about ourselves. Touring the desert. Touring the desert. Mm. When he wants to possess the land. He fully occupy the space that belongs to him. Mm. Right, so we have this treasure. Colossians. Colossians, yeah. I might as well just, 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 just while we're on verse 7. We might as well sneak in verse 8 of 2 Corinthians 4. We often feel completely hemmed in on every side, but our inner space remains unrestricted, where there seems to be no way out, we escape within. Let me just conclude our story when we were walking about the tax issue. So here we are, and we're encouraged. That's 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8. Verse 7 is the one about the treasure that we have. But we remember verse 4 says we're in blindfold mode because of unbelief. So what's the use of carrying a treasure and you're completely unaware of it? It's done. But when the, the God who said, the light shine out of darkness, shine into our hearts, let the lamps in our understanding, so that we could see for ourselves what we carry, the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations. Okay, so now we're back to then and I walking, and we, we're having this moment of the tax issue is not solved through us sweating through it, but through us doing what we enjoy doing most. In an indefensible back, as he coined the hospital. In here, I remember the other on the other time when they had a debate with Jesus about taxes. And Jesus said, bring the coin. Mm -hmm. And he held it up. And he asked the most simple question. He says, whose image and inscription are we talking about? This is a photograph of an old Roman coin. He says, whose image and inscription are we talking about? And everybody knew. Yes, Mr. Caesar himself. He says, well, return to Caesar, what belongs to Caesar. But here's the punchline. Where did Caesar get his image and likeness from? What, what inscription does Caesar carry in his DNA? Image bearer, return to the Father, what belongs to the Father. You see, Caesar's currency has to do with an image that we've adopted to the degree that we actually feel we owned by the government, we're owned by the taxation system. No, no. You're the son of the Father. And there's only one true currency. It's called image and likeness language. Amen. You're an image and likeness bearer. That's the currency of your being. That's the currency of who you are. And that translates into dollars, gold, rand, cents, whatever. But that's not what owns you. That's not what defines you. You are defined 
by the currency of life. Mm. Inscription. Mm. Inscription. Mm. My. Every cell in your being inscribed. Such an amazing thought, you know, to know that. That your human body. Dr. Smith Salman with the old mother say, you want to say that's 50 or 50 trillion cellar in our life. I can't tell you how many of you can Imagine 50 or 60 trillion cells. It's increasing as we speak. It's increasing as we speak. There we go. Not just like you start. And then, don't you have to say DNA kittens? And am I correct? Someone said that there are 3 billion individual characters in every single DNA strand. Sure. Now, let's just help you think this through. If What is the difference between one million seconds and three, one billion seconds? One million seconds equals 12 days, equal 12 days. So, one million seconds, if you can count one million seconds, it's going to take you 12 days. If that's all you do, don't sleep, don't eat, do nothing, just count. One per second. One billion seconds will take you 33 years. So if you have three billion individual characters in every one of your super trillion cells, and all you have to do for your entire life is to count those, those three billion, it's going to take you no, it's 32 years. So it's, it's 32 years. So three times 32 is 96. It'll take you 96 years to count the individual characters in one single DNA strand. And you've got trillions of them. One trillion second, seconds going to the thousands, I think like 30,000 years. Can you imagine what you carry? And that's just talking about the place life. Yeah, yes, God's a lift and a life. And God has found home in you, space in you. Oh my, my. So, I mean, we're talking about this treasure. So, when, when Paul writes it, we often feel completely hemmed in on every side, but our inner space remains unrestricted. When there seems to be no way out, we escape within. So, if we page through to Colossians, let me just briefly touch on Colossians. Because, you know, this thought that, that we have documented here, John 14, verse 20. I encourage you to engage with this thought and ask Holy Spirit to just unfold dimensions upon dimensions. In Romans 1.19, Paul says, whatever can be known of God is manifest in man. Whatever can be known of God. We have this treasure. Jesus says, out of your innermost being, gushes forth rivers of living water. We're not talking about a little pool of Siloam, you know, that's connected to some, some spring kilometers away. We're talking about the gushing forth of the life of the ages that we participate in. So, okay, let, let's just touch on Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. And Paul makes this beautiful statement. He says... Um, Colossians 1, I'll just read verse 27 to you. Mm. Within us, verse 27, God is delighted. Now let's read verse 26. Mankind's most sought after quest, the mystery which has remained elusive and concealed for ages and generations, is now fully realized in our redeemed innocence. Within us, God is delighted to exhibit the priceless treasure of this glorious unveiling of Christ's indwelling, in order that every person on the planet, whoever they are, may now come to the greatest discovery of all time and recognize Christ in them as in a mirror. This completes our every expectation. He says here, uh, my last, I said, well, what God is now able to disclose in the saints is immediately equally relevant in the nations. This is the essence and focus of our message. We awaken everyone's mind, instructing every individual by bringing them into full understanding, flawless clarity, in order that we may prove or present everyone, everyone perfect in Christ. 
Your completeness in Christ is not some remote goal, but your immediate reference. Just, just one more verse in this, in this context. is in, in Galatians chapter 1. Um, in verse 16, Paul says, uh, let me read you from verse 15. God's eternal love dream separated me from my mother's womb. His grace became my identity. This is the heart of the gospel that I proclaim. It began with an unveiling of His Son in me, freeing me to announce the same sonship in the masses of non-Jewish people. I felt no immediate urgency to compare notes with those who were familiar with Christ from a mere historic point of view. Now, you can take the time and go and just read the, the commentary note in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 16 and, and, and be overwhelmed with what it is that Paul is declaring there. He's not saying, many of our translations say that Paul says that God was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I may preach him to the nations. There's a large difference between discovering Christ in me and declaring him in the nations. You see, we're coming back to this reality. If we, we're not the geologists trying to, to make happy farmers, you know, just telling them, oh, you know, we've found some gold. You know, it's, it's not much. You know, it's just a little, a little speck of gold that we'd like to, to um, point out to you. We have a fantastic story. We have a beautiful story that, that, that I might as well throw in here. We, we live in the Otsuran area now, and what happened was um, um, 80 years plus ago, uh, a, a lady. Um, um, a lady was engaged to one of the wealthiest farmers in South Africa. He was an ostrich farmer, engaged to marry him. And um, during their engagement, I mean, they, they, they had it all. They, they had a gold-plated horse cart and the biggest diamond that you could imagine. And they would go to all the important functions, you know, members of parliament were their friends, and they were, they were really operating in a very high level of society. And um, during that time, she had an encounter with Jesus, and, and, and she was just gobsmacked. I mean, she just fell in love with God. And, and, and it was a bit of an embarrassing situation to her fiancé, so he broke the engagement. And a few years later, she fell in love with a, a, a farm laborer in the wooden Wooddalsrist, district in Velkom, the free, in the Free State. And she married this man. And this man was what they called a bayvoner. He didn't, owe, didn't own any land, but he lived at the mercy of a farmer on this person's farm. And him and his new bride just worked on this man's farm. They worked his farm for him for seven years. Married and working this farm for seven years. Then they had a unique opportunity to buy the farm. And they did. Shortly after they took title to the farm, the first gold in the Free State was discovered on their farm. Sure. And you can go and Google this. 22% of the world's gold comes out of that reef in Velcro today. 20% of the world's gold. By Velcro. <laughs> <laughs> she wrote a document. It's an dear family. We know the family. They're wonderful people. And she wrote a document, this old granny, 80 years ago. She said, you know, this, this maize farm has been cultivated as a maize field for generations. But the gold's been there all along. And you know what's the amazing thing about gold? It has its own voice. Sometimes we think, you know, renewing your mind is really some kind of disciplined thing. No, 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 no. You don't have to waste one moment trying to renew your mind. Just discover the gold. The gold will do all the talking. Sure. You don't have, oh, I've got, I've got gold, gold. Stop looking at me. Just, just go gold. No, no. You don't have to pray for rain. The gold's there. The gold's there. <laughs> face that. And she wrote a document. She says, you know, this is a hidden mystery for generations. And then she quoted Galatians 1. But the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations talking about a mystery that was hidden for ages and generations. People hear me. And this old lady said, the day will come that ordinary people will discover Christ in them. Wow. Sure. That's the gospel. We are so privileged to be alive at a time such as this. Sure. We may help people and introduce people to a treasure in their ordinary life, in their marketplace, to see more accurately. 
to see more than just the fishing industry, more than just the image and inscription of a Caesar, more than just the current political or the current economic situation that this world is faced with, mm -hmm. but discovering the currency of heaven in your mouth and in your heart. Redeem time. Engage with time from now on in the light of what redemption reveals. What an opportunity to live the adventure of Christ in you, in one another, in our fellowship, in our joint participation, in our joint seeing, just opening these curtains and the view is right there, smack in our faces. And now with unveiled faces, we behold His glory as in a mirror. It's a lovely old African song that um, we often sing. The, the song says, um, You're the Alpha and Omega We worship You, O Lord You are worthy to be praised be singing a tune there's a new tune oh, not a new tune a new, new word it says you're my father my redeemer you've reconciled my life to be one with you again you're my father my redeemer you've reconciled my life to be one with you again you're my father my redeemer you've reconciled my life to be one with you now with unveiled faces we behold your glory. And now with unveiled faces we behold your glory as in the mirror. And now with unveiled faces we behold your glory as in the mirror. You're my Father, my Redeemer. You've reconciled my life to be one with you again. You're my Father, my Redeemer. You've reconciled my life to be one with you again. And by the waters of reflection. And by the waters of reflection. My soul remembers who I am by your design. I sing it a little bit lower, otherwise we struggle with the chorus. You're my Father, my Redeemer. You've reconciled my life to be one with you again. You're my Father, my Redeemer. You've reconciled my life. By the waters of reflection and by the waters of reflection my soul remembers my soul remembers who i am by your design yes by the waters of reflection my soul remembers who i am by your design now with unveiled faces
such treasure. Mm. Oh my Lord. Mm. Mm. God boldly mm. commending himself. Which is we, we recommend our lives. But we don't <coughs> preach ourselves. We don't travel the world to impress people with us. We we'll only impress you with you. We want to hold up the mirror so that you may know for yourself the mirror makes it so personal. It's used after. Mm. It loves you. Mm -hmm. it loves you, loves you. Can I just read you one verse? And that's it. And it's in Galatians. It's a new verse that we, we, we kind of update some of the verses from time to time. I just want to read you Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. So here I am, says Paul, dead and alive at the same time. 
I'm dead to the old me I was trying to be and alive to the real me which is Christ in me. Co crucified, now co alive. What a glorious entanglement. I was in him in his death. Now he's in me in my life. For the first time I'm free to be me in my skin, immersed in his faith, in our joint sonship. He loves me and believes in me. He's God's gift to me. Amen. Thank you, David. Guys, Lydia also wrote the song once, eh? and her song goes like this. Jesus knows me, this I love. <laughs> <laughs>